If you are watching this video, you want to learn how to make a Backrooms animation like this. Well, guess what? That's exactly what I'm going to show you. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Schnoike, and today I'm going to be giving you a step-by-step -step breakdown on how I made my latest Backrooms video. It's actually really easy, and you can do it for free, besides the equipment involved like a computer and an iPhone. Those are the only pieces of equipment you'll need. All the software is free which is very cool. So for my project, I used Blender because it's free and it's really good for this type of project. So I'm gonna start here by building the environment. Now the back rooms are very simple. All you need is a plane, stretch that out a bit. So I'm gonna start with a cube to make the wall, GZ to go up, uh, SY to scale it in the Y direction, and then I'm going to scale it up a bit. And you're basically just trying to make a wall of some sort. It doesn't have to be super um, realistic looking. It can be just this thick chunk of a wall, or you can um, make it a little bit smaller, um, make it a little bit more proportional. It depends on what type of backrooms animation you want to make. But for mine, I decided to kind of stick close to reality. Now, one thing that makes backrooms animations look more realistic is adding this little thing on the bottom of the wall. I don't know exactly what it's called. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to press Shift D to uh, duplicate the object, uh, S Z to scale it down a bit so that it's a uh, good width. Um, G, Z to bring it down here, and then I'm going to scale it up just a little bit. So now we have that part, and you can see that this bit right here is sticking out a bit, so you can press S, X there. Again, you can put as much detail or as little detail as you want. Um, more detail will just take more time. Once you have this wall, you want to select the big part of the wall, uh, add a new material, and name it something like Wall 1, uh, and the second one... Uh, as wall two so that you can keep track of them. So for the colors and textures of these walls, you can do whatever you want. If you wanted to just do a base color, you select wall one and you kind of make it into a yellowish uh, color. And then this part of the wall, you'll just make yellow, but a little bit darker, not too much darker, but a little bit. And it'll look uh, much better when it's in rendered view and you can play around with uh, the texturing and everything like that. What I ended up doing for the wall texture was clicking on this little yellow dot by base color and then switching it to image texture over here, opening my file up. And as you can see here, I've got my wallpaper one labeled and I had uh, drawn that out. You could also use an image from online and, and source whoever you got it from. Open image on that. You'll notice here that the texture did not apply to the wall like we wanted it to. Uh, so I'm gonna go to the shading tab. I'm going to add a texture coordinate node, and then I'm going to add a mapping node. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put the UV into the vector for the mapping and the mapping into the vector for the image. And that will allow us to now scale it. Here, I'll give you a better view here. Scale it in the X direction scale it in the Y direction, and you'll be probably working with those the most. Z, yeah, Z doesn't do anything on that. Um, and then you're going to rotate, I believe, in the Z direction until it looks about right. That looks like it'll be at a uh, um, 270 degree. And so scale it a little bit better until it looks right. That looks pretty good to me. Now this bottom part, we can change the color of to make it match the top wall better. And for me, when I was doing this, this looked a little green as opposed to yellow, as you can see here in my first test image. So I selected whatever lights I was doing uh, and I changed them to be a little bit more of a yellow tint and that made it, you know, a lot more uh, yellow and backroomsy. Next, you're gonna to wanna to add a texture for the carpet, uh, and for that, you can just do a base color here, um, make it a nice putrid shade of yellow, uh, and you can um, turn up the roughness and bring down the specular a bit to make it uh, a bit more realistic, and you can add whatever uh, textures you want to that to make it look more like a carpet. 
Once you have this main wall created, you can select the main wall, select the second wall and join if you want to, and then Shift D will duplicate it with all textures that you had on the original one, uh, and that helped me a lot. Copy paste actually creates a new uh, texture with like a different numbering, like wall 1.001, and it's no good. It, it gets really messy. So Shift D helps a lot. And once you've duplicated this wall, you can go to the top down view by clicking this little Z dot. You can rotate here um, in this tab. You can switch it to negative 90 degrees. Uh, you can move it around a bit and you can basically just make a maze with these walls so that it looks like the back rooms. Now that we've got kind of a little maze going here, you'll notice that we're missing a very important part, which is the ceiling and the lights that are in the ceiling. And those are actually more important than you might think for selling the realness of the back rooms, even if you're not trying to make it that real. Now you can do the ceiling a lot of different ways, but for the back rooms, it's supposed to be this hanging ceiling type uh, texture. So you can make it an actual texture, but that might make it hard for the lights. So what I did, and you can do this differently if you want, but is I grabbed a cube here, scaled it up a bit, went to edit mode, pressed loop cut over in the left bar, hovered over the cube until I got this little yellow line and click and drag all the way up here so that you've just got a little bit of a border on the top and then clicked on this side to do the same here, the same width, um, clicked here again to do that on the bottom and again on the right. I then switched to face select mode, then turned on toggle x-ray and then I group selected this part of the cube that's inside the outline, right clicked and delete faces. So now you've got this kind of hollow cube. If you go back into object mode, you can click SZ to scale it down so that it's basically this very little thin thing. And this little box is supposed to be the outline between the hanging ceiling. Uh, so I'm going to make a new material and call it something like ceiling one because you generally want to keep things organized. Uh, and then I'm gonna press Shift D, move that over here so that it's right next to it. Shift D again, like this. And then I'm going to select all of these. Shift D, go to this direction. Shift D again, and Shift D again. And the reason why I'm doing this is because we want the lights to be spread out a bit. So now you've got this nice little grid of squares here. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a new cube. You're gonna scale it down so that it fits into one of those squares. Once it fits, you're just gonna want to scale it so that it kind of fits in better. So from here, S and then Z will make it like this. And you're gonna wanna make it a little thicker just so that it sticks out a bit. Gonna go into side view and move it so that it's just kind of sticking up. See, we're trying to emulate that hanging ceiling look. So it's gonna stick up just a little bit outside of the grid. And then you're gonna want to add a material to this and call it ceiling two, just to keep everything concise. I'm then gonna go into top down view, press shift D with this selected, move it in the Y direction. Shift D again, select the new one, move it in the Y direction. And then I'm going to select all these, shift D once, bring it into this square, shift D again, bring it into this square, and finally shift D to the last one. Now if I go down to this side uh, and I change this uh, texture to let's say a black, just for example, you can see that there's a nice hanging ceiling look happening here. And now for the lights, I'm gonna select this cube up here, the original one that we made. I'm gonna make a new texture and I'm gonna call it ceiling lights. And that's what this one is going to be. And I'm going to go down here to where it says surface. I'm gonna click this and press emission. Now at this point you should be using cycles to render because then you can accurately figure out how your lighting will look. So I'll go back down here to material properties. I'm gonna go to the render view just so that I can see what it looks like. And I'm going to crank this emission up until you can start to see that there's some sort of light happening there. And since we had figured out that this orangey tone looks a lot better than just white because white just looks really yellowy, I'm going to change this so that it's slightly 
orange. I think this definitely looks better than just normal white light. Uh, and you can make this as bright or as uh, dim as you want. But really for animations like this where you're going for lower detail, the less light the better because the more shadows you have, the more realistic it'll look at a first glance. Now I'll just fix these ceiling colors. For this uh, frame, I'm going to make it like a darker uh, orangey color. And for the main frame, I'm going to make it that same color, just a little bit lighter. Just so that when you look at it, there's a little bit of a difference. So that looks pretty good, and you can play around with it more until you find a color that you really like. And now what I'm going to do is make this so that it covers the whole scene. So I'm going to select all of these objects. So hide that cube real quick. Box select everything. Uh, in the ceiling and shift click the light so that it's got a, an object selected. I'm going to right click and press join. So now it is one uh, object and you've still got all of your textures here so you can change them even after you've done this. Now you're going to go from the texture tab to the modifier tab. You're going to click add modifier and array. And oh, look at that, it made another ceiling. In this tab, you've got the array settings, and right now it's set to factor X is one, but it's going kind of the wrong direction from the scene. So I'm actually going to, and you can slide this around so that it's a uh, different distance from the other object, but I'm gonna make this negative one so that it's actually going into the scene where we want it. And now since we want it to cover the whole room, I'm going to increase the count here, and that'll increase uh, the count of the objects with the same uh, relative offset. Once I've got this done, I'm going to click Add Modifier again and click Array again. Uh, now it's got the same settings here. I'm going to set Factor X to 0 and Factor Y to 1. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to make it negative 1. So now it's going this direction, and when I increase the count, it will now cover the scene nicely. So now we've got the whole scene lit. And as you can see, now that we're looking at it with all the lights in place, there is a lot of light, probably too much light. So now I'm going to go back to the materials and I'm going to decrease the strength of this light because there are more of them. So now I can get away with making it uh, a lot dimmer. So at this point in time, we want to start working on our camera, which is probably the most important part about this animation. So we somehow want to get super realistic camera movements into Blender for like a found footage style video. So what we're going to do is go to the Apple App Store and search up CamTrack AR. And this is the app that you're going to want to use. Now, I don't know an Android equivalent for this app, uh, but it is free for all Apple users. Once you've got this downloaded, you're going to click open and you can see that you can see my room now and now it starts immediately putting a grid down on the floor so right now it is tracking the floor and i think this works better with the newer iphones because they've got um, more depth perception or something like that we've got the room we've got the grid uh, and as you can see the grid is staying solid even as I move the camera So what I'm gonna do now is click this button on the bottom left corner to set the floor And now it is set and it's staying completely static as I move around now What I'm gonna do is click the record button on the right and I'm gonna get some footage now that it's stopped recording, you can see this pop-up that comes up and it automatically saves to your files. So I'm going to click go to files and in the files, you've got this nice set of videos, including your source footage. And you can use this um, for your audio. So for starters, we're only going to export the .hfcs file and the .py file. I've got my HFCS and Python files in a folder, so now I'm going to go back to the project, click Edit, Preferences, Install. Once you've found your folder here, you're going to see that it shows up with the Python file and you're going to click Install Add-on. Now you should see this add-on, hit Film AR App Composite, and you're going to make sure that that is checked. Now when you go to File Import, you should see down at the bottom hit film AR tracking data. You're going to click that. As soon as I did that, it imported this camera into the scene. And as you can see down here, it has a bunch of keyframes for the camera. And when I press play, 
it goes into the wall. Without that wall, you can see that the camera is now moving like it's handheld because it's using those keyframes in relation to the tracking data. What you're gonna wanna do now to make your life easier is shift right click to get the 3D cursor there, add empty plane axes. Then you're gonna click the camera, then shift click the empty, right click parent object. Now, when you move this empty, it moves the camera and all of the keyframes. Otherwise, if you move the camera in one keyframe, it would just lock back into another. And what I've found is that my scene is oftentimes too big for the camera, so I'm just going to scale up the empty and it scales up the camera with it. But now I'm seeing that when I click on the camera, it's actually taking the footage from a camera I already have in the scene, not the actual uh, moving camera. So we need to fix that. Down here in the timeline, you're gonna go to, let's say, frame one. You're gonna go to marker and add marker. Then you're gonna select the camera that has the keyframes. You're gonna go to marker again and bind camera to markers. So now, this is going to be the active camera. And you can see that it looks really good because it's just handheld tracking data, so it looks exactly like it would. Now while you're in camera, you can also edit where the camera is by editing the empty. Now you have to make sure that the empty is selected, not the camera. So now I'm in camera and I'm going to rotate on the Z axis, and sometimes it's a little finicky, so you want to use this tab more often than not. And I can move it till it looks a little bit better. Sometimes it also helps to rearrange the architecture once you have a shot path, so then you can get the important things in your shot that you want to get recorded. So that's looking pretty good. Now one thing I did for the animation to make it look more like a camcorder as opposed to an iPhone, uh, was I went down here to where the empty is and the camera parented to it. I clicked on the uh, camera to get to the settings. And right here you can see that the focal length is keyframed. So what I did was clear keyframes, and then I set this to something like 50.76, doesn't really matter, but that makes it so that it looks like a camcorder as opposed to some sort of wide angle lens. Once you've got a scene that you're really happy with, go up here to the scene settings. Uh, and what I did to speed up the process is render it at 640 by 480, which is 4.3 resolution. And that goes along with the focal length in order to make it look like a camcorder. Once you've got that done, you can go up one section and check motion blur. That will make it a lot more realistic. One more thing to do to help with the realism is to go into the compositing tab. Click use nodes if you haven't already. Then you're going to add glare. You're gonna put that in between these two. And you're also going to add a viewer node so that you can see your changes. So the glare is pretty weird looking right now, but if you go to the glare node, you can change streaks to fog glow, and that will make it a lot more realistic already. Now you can change these settings as much as you want. This looks pretty good for this scene though, because it's a soft, subtle glare on kind of a simple scene. So just doing a test render here, and that does not look too shabby. Obviously you can play around with the video settings as much as you want. Now one thing you're seeing here is it's very grainy. So the one last thing you want to do is go down to denoising, which is at this top section here, and you're going to want to click on the check, and NLM is what it's set to. I think the other ones do something else, but <laughs> you could figure that out. And as you can see, it is now denoising the tiles, so it'll render them first and then it will make them less noisy. And now you've got a pretty good looking scene for the amount of time spent. So the scene looks good, everything is working smoothly, and now you can decide what format you want to export the file in. For my animation, I exported it all as PNG, and I kept it at RGB 8-bit just to reinforce the camcorder look. One option is switching the file format to AVI JPEG. Now this actually gives you a quality meter, so if you're really going for that old tape look, you can put it down to 70% or something like that, and it will really do the job. Once you've got everything set up correctly, go up to Render and click Render Animation. And here is the final shot.
Now you'll notice that the only thing I really did was added in the audio from the source footage, no VHS effects or anything like that, because I've been talking for 20 minutes and you're probably tired of my voice. Um, but yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this tutorial, uh, and I hope it taught you something new. Big thanks again to YouTuber Kane Pixels. Uh, he was the one who made the first Backrooms found footage video that really blew up um, and inspired me to make mine. Uh, so big thanks to him, go subscribe to him, and I hope that this video uh, taught you all something new, and um, I hope that it's helpful in making a Backrooms animation of your own. Alright, have a great day guys, and uh, I'll see ya.